He is dependable. Whatever it is, sing it with me.
But you chased us down in merciful pursuit That's who he is, that's what he's done To the sinner you were grace And the broken you embrace And in the end the proof is in yours Yes it is! Hey. Yes in the end the proof is in yours There's a God who pleases Oh, praise the one Who would reach for me yeah. Hallelujah To the sign of suffering Hallelujah You are worthy of it all Yes, you are your cross, my freedom, your stripes are my healing. All praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching. All praise, come on, King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross. story testify say in all my life you have been faithful we've seen it man in all my life you have been so yes. with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who pleads. Oh, praise the one who will reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the sun and suffering. Amen. 
We thank him for who he is. We thank him for what he's done. And we thank him for what he continues to do through the power of Jesus in us. Amen. Thanks for singing with us. Y'all can have a seat. If we look at our lives as a journey, there are paths that are filled with joy and celebration, answered prayers and the consistency of good solid routines. Then there are the darker paths filled with loss, grief, loneliness, unanswered prayers, waiting. In my own life, I recently journeyed through a season where I felt like I turned a corner and suddenly the path was unclear and full of shadows. During that time, it was so tempting to give into the darkness and give up, to stop taking steps forward, to stop praying, to stop believing. I prayed for direction, healing, clarity, a miracle. And when I felt like all I received in return was silence, Jesus reached out and began lighting up my steps one by one. John 1.5 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Another name for Jesus is the light of the world. No matter how consuming the darkness around us feels, it's His light that shines through, and it is our choice to turn our face away from the dark to the light and to keep going. As we enter a time of communion, will you take another step closer to the light today? The Christian faith is a journey. We're all moving and learning at a different pace, sometimes with detours along the way. But there are many in our midst who are stuck, wrestling with questions, digging for truth. Maybe it's you, a friend, or someone you love, taking things apart to see what's really inside. Letting go of the things that once felt dear. Feeling alone on the search for answers. Don't settle for deconstruction. In the midst of your questions, doubts, fears, there's a firm foundation and you can build your life on it. Okay, before we get into the message, I want you to help me settle this long-standing debate. You, you can join in if you like. Who makes the better truck, Ford or Chevy? Yeah, some of you are going, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. I guarantee you the people who answered out loud on your campus own a Ford or Chevy. Those who don't have a truck, they don't care. They're, all trucks are the same. Okay, this one, this one. My wife appreciates this. Which is the better store, Walmart or Target? That, that, that felt a little universal to me. I don't care. Like, they're the same to me. I would actually have to enter one of those stores to care about which one was better. But for my wife, for my wife, the red dot is her happy place. <laughs> Here's one I do care about. Dunkin' versus Starbucks. <laughs> there is a right answer. <laughs> Starbucks burns their beans. I'm sorry that made some of you angry, 
look, this is church. You have the right to be wrong. (laughs) We still love you. You may still go to heaven. What I've noticed is that when people have an opinion about something, it's because they're an insider, not an outsider. But when people say, hey, they're all the same. All coffee's the same. They don't like coffee. All stores are the same. They don't like to shop. All trucks are the same. They're probably di- driving a, you know, a, a Nissan or something. If you, <laughs> I guess that was too personal for someone. <laughs> if you don't care, you're the person saying they're all the same. Now you've heard this. All of you have heard this from someone that probably doesn't care. All religions are pretty much the same. Are they really? Like, that, it sounds to me like that's an outsider going, I really don't care about religion. And so if, if maybe you're an outsider right now and go, yeah, I really, I really don't care. But you're here because, well, the person said, I'm not going to date you unless you come to church with me. So here you are. It can't hurt that bad, right? And it, no, no judgment. It's just that's not your thing. Or if you're, if you're saying, you know what, I, like, I used to be religious, but I got burned That's a lot of people's story. And so I'm only coming back now to see if I can maybe somehow reconstruct my faith. But yeah, I'm not really bought in. Or maybe you're watching online going, should I go to that place? It seems like, like, I don't know. It's the person who's outside is more likely to say, they're all the same. But are they all the same? So let's test this, okay? I'm going to ask a question that is pretty central to every religion. It's a, it's a major question. That is, how do you get rewarded in the afterlife? And for you, that might be nirvana, where you reach this state. Or, or maybe for you, it's going to heaven. Or for some, it's like a bunch of virgins. Like Whatever your version of the afterlife is, religion tries to answer the question, what do I have to do to get rewarded in the afterlife? So let's just ask the four major religions of the world what do you have to do to achieve reward in the afterlife? If Islam would give a very clear answer. They have five pillars. Four of the five pillars answer the question, what you do for God. So clearly, that's the answer. Whatever you do for God, that's what gets you into the uh, reward for the afterlife. For Jews, they have ten commandments, not five pillars. Half of the Ten Commandments are about what you do for God, but the other half are what you do for your family, including other Jews around you. So love God, love your neighbor. If, you're, you know, if they're your neighbor, if they're also Jews, then you need to love them, you need to treat them civilly. So what you do for God, what you do for others. For Hindus, it, it, this is really different because uh, Hindus believe that there's not just one afterlife, but you come life after life after life. After, it's called reincarnation. Thousands, maybe millions of times you could be reincarnated. And the goal is for you to get better with each passage and get into a higher form so that ultimately you reach nirvana. You want to know what nirvana is other than a band? Nirvana, according to the Hindus, is nothingness. So you reach a state of nothingness at the end of the game. So for Hindus, bottom line is, it's what you do for yourself. How can you improve yourself so that you can get out of this uh, physical existence that we have? What about Christians? What does the church say? What does the Bible teach about how to receive reward in the afterlife? I think you'll notice a difference. It's not about what you do for God. It's not about what you do for others. It's not even about what you do for yourself. It's what was done for you. The Bible teaches that all of us have sinned, and because of that sin, there's brokenness and there's separation from God. And the solution is not you being good enough to deserve God, or even treating other people good enough to be rewarded by God. It's about God sacrificing his one and only son for you. And that's what the Bible teaches about how to get to heaven. Now, the reason we're bringing this up in this series, the series called Reconstruction, is a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons, they've lost their faith. And maybe that's you. Maybe it's because of pain. Maybe it's because of a loss. Maybe someone offended you or hurt you. Or maybe you just stopped believing. 
But you're thinking, and maybe that's why you're here, you're thinking, I really, like I was better off when I had faith. And I want to reconstruct some kind of faith to recapture the quality of life I had or the hope I had or the peace I had. And, and one of the questions that causes many people to deconstruct their faith is this idea that Jesus is the only way. It, it sounds bigoted. I, I know. It sounds narrow. I, I know. But what you should know about me is for, this is not a sermon for me. This is my biography. And when Ashley asked me to preach it, I kind of cringed a little bit because whenever you come out and say, Jesus is the only way, people go, oh, yeah, really, you're one of them. Like narrow-minded and, and bigoted and judgmental. That's not my heart. Here's the reality of my own biography. I'm one of the only Christians in my family. And so I, I came to a, a, a decision point. Am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to follow my family? There was a cost to the decision that I made. I, I still pay the price for this decision at, at Thanksgiving or Christmas. I'm the one that's gossiped about when I'm not in the room. Now, some of you live that way more than I do, so I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. It's just my reality. When I came to make this decision, what really was hard for me is this question, is Jesus the only way? Because, that again, that just felt cringe worthy to just be so narrow in your focus. And so the first thing I did was just ask the question of the Bible. Does the Bible really say that Jesus is the only way to God? It does. And you need to know this, especially if you're like been critical of the church. Yeah, they're just judgmental. When we say that Jesus is the only way, I know sometimes it comes across as, we're right, you're wrong, you're probably going to hell. I'm not judging anybody. Like, that's above my pay grade. This is the question I had to answer for my own decision to follow Jesus or follow my family. But here's what I think we're trying to say, and maybe we haven't said it well, I apologize. What we're trying to say is, there was no way. Like, we were lost, there was no way to get to God. There was no way to straighten out this mess of my own life. There was no way for me to make myself worthy of eternity with God. There was no way until God made a way. And because Jesus made a way, I can find a way to get to God. I think that's what we're trying to say. But it's actually in the Bible. Jesus' two best friends Peter and John both said something. John put it like this in his very first chapter of his book. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, I'm not asking you to believe that, but just know that's what John believed. Jesus' best friend. That no one else lived with God, came to earth, told us about God, and said, hey, follow me because I can get you to God. Now, if you've found someone who can do that, follow him. But John and myself, I, I, like, I, I don't know of anybody else who does that. Peter, Jesus' other best friend. If you've ever been to Rome, you've probably seen St. Peter's Basilica and his statue out in front. He's like, he's a big deal. Peter, in his very first sermon, Acts chapter 2 uh, or Acts, Acts chapter 14, he's preaching his sermon, and here's what Peter has to say about Jesus being the only way. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Okay, so you've got Peter and John, Jesus' two best friends, saying the same thing, like he's the only way. Where well, there was no way, he made a way. Where did they get that idea? from Jesus. It, Jesus was actually the very first person to ever say, I'm the only way. It was an upper room, a private conversation the night before he died. He turns to the 12 apostles that he had, and from Jesus' own lips, here's what Jesus says about Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one get, comes to the Father except through me. Now, what's interesting about this to me is like, 
Almost every other religion has deep respect for Jesus. If you're a Muslim, you believe that he is one of the greatest prophets. If you're a Jew, not, not all Jews have anything good to say about Jesus, but some do, and what they'll say typically is he was a very wise rabbi. For Hindus, when they learn about Jesus, they love him, they love him. And they will say, uh, like, he may even be a god, and they put him on a shelf with the other gods that they serve. Some of them have millions of gods in Hinduism, but they, they, they really do respect Jesus. Virtually everyone respects Jesus, even atheists. Say, well, you know, he's a great moral teacher, and look at what he did for humanity, for human rights. But if you take Jesus seriously, in his own words, it was Jesus that said, I am the only way to get to God. Look, this is interesting. Nobody calls Jesus a bigot because he was open to all. He, he, he did more for women and more for the lost and more for outsiders and more for those with diseases than anybody ever has. He certainly is not narrow-minded. He's certainly not judgmental. He's certainly not bigoted. And yet he said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I had to wrestle with this. I had to wrestle with it with my own family. Am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to follow them? So I came up with this question that helped me, and I'm going to share it with you. The, the question that I had to answer to determine the own trajectory of my life was this. Did Jesus do anything that nobody else did? Because if we're going to say that he's the only way to God, then he had to do something that you cannot find in any other human being in any other religion. I didn't come up with one. I came up with four. Here's the first one. Jesus lived a perfect life. Now, I could just hear some of you, maybe you're skeptical or maybe you came with a friend and you don't know anything about this religious stuff, but you came and you're, you know, your ears are open, but you're going, really? He lived a perfect life? Sure, that's what the church said about him years after he died. They memorialized him. Actually, no. You know who the first person was to say that Jesus was perfect? Jesus. And he didn't say it in a private room. He said it in the temple of God as a public space. His, his, the, the religious leaders, they don't like Jesus because people are following Jesus instead of them. And so they're trying to knock him off his pedestal. And in John chapter 8, Jesus asked them a question. Can any of you Prove me guilty of sin. If there's anything that you will never hear me say, it's that. <laughs> like, I know what would happen. Someone would raise their hand and go, uh, yeah, I saw you driving out I-17, and it was like, that was not Christian. <laughs> or someone would say, well, I was in Fry's the other day, and I overheard your conversation, and mm-mm, mm-mm. And this would be worst of all. This would be so embarrassing. If none of you said anything, my wife would come on stage. <laughs> there is no way that I would ever say that. Can you imagine an athlete in a press conference saying, look, I'm a perfect player. Can, can you show me anything I've done wrong in this game or the entire season? Could you, can you identify one mistake I made? Like every, every hand would shoot up, right? You know who you will never, never, never hear ask this question? Politicians. I mean, seriously, that would, be, that would be the end of their career. And yet Jesus claimed it in public with his enemies. And you know what they said? That's exactly what they said. Nothing. The silence was deafening because even his enemies could not find one point of moral failure in his life. It was not just how Jesus lived. It's how Jesus died. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. And because Jesus laid down his life for us, he made a way when there was no way. I think you probably know this verse. It's the most famous in all of the Bible. It's John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not be put to death 
shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Jesus is not narrow-minded. He's not, he's not against you. He's for you, and he gave his life for you. And here's what blows my mind about this. He didn't give his life for you when you deserved it. He didn't even give his life for you when you decided to follow him. He gave his life for you when you were an enemy of his. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I, this is such an important point. I wanted to illustrate it. So I, sometimes when I need life stories, I'll reach out to our pastors on different campuses and say, hey, can any of you find this kind of story? So I said, I, I want a story of someone who was an enemy of God, but God loved them anyway. I, I've done this frequently, but I have never gotten as much response as this question. Our pastors flooded me with stories all over your campus. In fact, probably in the row you're sitting in right now, or if you're watching online, I bet there's someone in the room with you right now that while they were an enemy of God, they had no interest in God, they weren't following God, they were running from God, but God pursued them relentlessly. There are dozens of stories in my inbox. There are thousands of stories in our church. There are millions of stories around the world of God pursuing people even when they didn't pursue him. And one of the stories that caught my attention was from our Midtown campus. A man by the name of Sean, he met his wife in 2012 in rehab. Both of them had addiction problems. When they got out of rehab, they got married, they had a little girl, it was a beautiful family. And for five years, he was sober. He was clean. But he decided to take matters into his own hands. Instead of relying on God, he, he relied on himself and he, he quickly fell back into his addiction patterns. And it began to deteriorate the relationship so much so that in 2019, they got divorced. And he was just, he was just running down his own road. The breakup of their marriage also caused her to walk away from God. And she, she, she wanted nothing to do with God. She lost her faith. But she, she only lost her faith in God. She didn't lose her faith in Sean. And so she kept pursuing him, pursuing him. But he's, he's an addict. They kept going down the wrong path. And in 2020, because of drugs, he's driving his car. And he had an accident that should have ended in fatalities. When, when he was running away from God, God was running towards him. And God, in his mercy, spared his life. It kind of was a wake-up call for Sean. And so a couple months later, he goes into rehab. His wife is still pursuing him, even though he's an addict and even though he nearly killed someone and nearly went to prison. She kept pursuing him. And it was then that Sean rekindled his faith in God and actually started pursuing God. It was this last year, they got remarried, and as they rebuilt their own marriage, it also rekindled her faith, and they both now attend and serve on our Midtown campus, and I could go on for days with stories like that all over our church. The question for me is, like, it's not academic. It's, the question is, who, who is the one that can put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Do, do you know of anyone who would pursue you while you're an enemy and rebuild your life like that? If you do follow them, I know of no one who's made a way when there was no way. And it's not just that Jesus died for you. He actually rose from the dead. The Bible teaches that Jesus conquered death by raising from the dead. 
This is, again, from the Apostle Peter, chapter 2 of the book of Acts. Peter's preaching his very first sermon. Verse 32 says, God raised this Jesus to life. It's Peter preaching. And we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit as poured out what you now see and hear. And 3,000 people that day got baptized because of that testimony that Jesus raised from the dead. And some of you are going, really? You believe that a dude rose from the grave? Like, really? Uh, Yeah, those people did. And they lived in the same city where Jesus was crucified. They walked the same streets where Jesus was buried. And this is only 50 days after the event. If it wasn't real, why did they believe? (laughs) There are three reasons that I am convinced, well, multiple reasons, but I'm going to give you three things that help me really come, overcome this hurdle of believing in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and they all have to do with the church. You see, the early church, they were all Jewish, and so you've got the, a group of people that when Jesus died, they're done. Like they're, they didn't burst out in celebration. They're done. Jesus died, they're done. They're, they're, they're scattering to the four winds. They're hunkering down behind locked doors. They were weeping, it was dark. But something happened after the third day that caused them to regather together. And they, they built this, unlikely, they built a church around this belief that Jesus was resurrected. Because in that early church, again, all Jewish, do you know what day they worshiped? You know what day Jews, Jews worship, right? It, it's Saturday, the Sabbath. How do you get a group of Jews after 1,500 years to change their tradition? You've seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? You know that's not happening without an earth-shattering event. And, and when they gathered on Sundays, one of the things they always did was to take communion, Think about this. You, you got a group of kosher Jews who are taking a, a, a piece of bread representing Jesus' body and a cup of juice representing his blood, eating his body and drinking his blood. If Jesus was still dead and they knew it, that would never happen. I mean, ritual, like eating of flesh, if he's still a corpse, that Never happened. The other thing they did, and we're going to do it after each service on all of our campuses this weekend, is baptism. Where you go into the water, you're you're, you're ritually dying to Jesus and, and coming up again in a new life. And I remember my first month here on staff is back in, in 2012, it was the middle of summer. A father came up to me and he said, My nine year old son wants to be baptized, but I like, I don't know how to explain baptism to him. Could, could you explain it to him? So I said, absolutely. And we were on the Peoria campus. And if you've been to the Peoria campus of the baptistry, you'll, you'll notice that uh, at the top of the hill, there's a cross. And then right below it, we've reconstructed a, 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 a tomb from the first century. It's, it's an empty tomb. And so I had, the, I had this little boy kneel down on the grass in front of the baptistry, and I said, do you read? And he, he was very proud of himself. I read very well. I said, okay, I, w- I want you to read this one verse out of Romans 6. And here's what it says. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might have a new life. And I kid you not, the kid looks up and, and he points up to the cross and he was, oh, I, I get it. Like Jesus died on the cross, and, and then he rose from the dead. Okay, he comes out of the tomb, and when we go into the water, we're dying, and we come out of the water, we're being raised to new life. Nine years old. Yep, buddy, that's exactly what we're doing. Why would they do that if Jesus wasn't raised to life? I mean, baptism would look really different. You could still go, okay, you're buried with Christ, until the bubbles stop coming. (laughs) There is no way that there would be baptism or communion or Sunday worship if there wasn't the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Can you point to anyone who loved you when you were their enemy? Anyone who lived a sinless life and died for you and rose from the dead? If you can, follow them. But if you can't, I know of one man who made a way when there was no way. And that man right now is doing something for you that you may be unaware of. Right now, in this moment, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says that Jesus is defending us with the Father. It is, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 puts it like this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. And there in the throne room of God, when you sin, Jesus looks down at that sin and he leans over to his dad on his left elbow and he says, hey dad, you see that? You see that? Let's call it even. If you have anyone defending you like that, I would say follow them. If you have anyone who died for your sins, follow them. If you know of anyone who rose from the dead, for sure follow them. If you know of anyone who's led a sinless life, follow them. I'm not trying to be narrow-minded. I'm not trying to be bigoted. I'm just trying to be realistic. Jesus has done what no one else could do, would do, and he did it for you. He did it for you. So years ago, when I had this decision to make, am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to follow my family? This was the deal. If Jesus could prove that he did what no one else could do, that I would give him my life. And Jesus made a promise to me. He's actually made a promise to you. It's in scripture. That anyone who gives up houses or fathers or sisters or brothers or houses or lands for my sake, I will give you a hundredfold. That's actually 10,000% interest. I'm here to tell you Jesus has more than fulfilled that promise to me. I have two biological brothers. In this church alone, I have more than 20,000. I had one home. But right now, if, if I were ever stranded, really anywhere in the country, I could make a phone call to somebody that's like family to me. And they would put me up. If I were in trouble and I needed to call someone at two in the morning, I have a Rolodex of over a hundred names that I could call. That's what Jesus wants to do for you, and I don't know of anyone else who can or would. So when I say that Jesus is the only way, it's, it's not because we want to judge you or condemn you or criticize anybody. It's, this is for everybody that the arms of Jesus are open wide to the entire world. And that's why today, if you want to confess your faith that Jesus is the only way for you, on every campus, after every service, our baptistries will be open. And if you aren't sure what that means, like we'll take the time to walk you through the decision. Just go to the guest services tent on your campus and we'll, we'll be there. There'll be a pastor that will walk with you. If you're ready, we're ready for you. In fact, after this next song, the host of your campus is gonna give you very clear instructions of how you, right now, could give your life to Jesus and express that faith in baptism. But we're gonna sing in response to this message. And if you believe it, sing with us this song. Oh, it's true. Jesus made a way. Holy Father, when there was no way, you sent your, your son Jesus to make a way. We do believe in him. We are indebted to him. And whatever the cost is, of following him and not following a career or a passion or a drug or a relationship, whatever that cost is, it is 10,000% worth it 
And I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would convict that person that's on the fence, that they can reconstruct a faith, a faith that is real, and a faith that will last clear to eternity. We celebrate this in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Planted the sun when he prayed in the garden, accepting the will of the Father. He chose a cross that day. That day, the sins of the world on a county. The one who the prophets has spoken chose a cross that day. His body was Love 